Our next speaker is Dr. Corin Nidek, and she was our keynote speaker in 2019. Yes, we were <laughs> when we launched our membership branch of this society. And she was fascinating then, and she's going to fascinate us again, I'm sure. She works at the National Park. She's the Chief of Resource Stewardship. And she has a lot of jobs in that role. She's a member of the leadership team at the park. So she looks at how flora and fauna, plants and animals, respond to climate change. And what, four or five years ago, she talked to us about how beavers we're helping us maintain our water table. Oh. So let's hear what she has to say today. I'm sure she's going to fascinate us again. Corin Nidek. Thank you, everyone, for coming. This is exciting to be a full room here. Um, yeah, so I was asked to talk about climate change in the park with a focus on flora and fauna. So I'm going to do that. And I'm going to give you a taste because, as you can imagine, that's a very big topic. Oh, and I will say, so the resource stewardship team at the park, um, I represent a lot of people. We have about a little less than 40 permanent staff, um, some of whom are firefighters. So it's it includes um, natural resources, cultural resources, the fire program. We have a research learning center, and we also have a team that works on environmental compliance and land issues. So when we say resource stewardship, that's kind of the portfolio at the park that um, I lead. And in the summer, that balloons to over 100. We have seasonal employees, and we have interns. Um, we also have tons of volunteers. Is anyone here a volunteer in the park? Yes, thank you very much. Um, very important. And then we have lots of partners and, and collaborators that we work with, um, nonprofits, other agencies, um, universities, uh, etc. So really, you know, um, it takes a very big and um, integrated team to be able to, you know, address things like I'm going to talk about. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about this through plants and animals, but I'm going to have some themes. I'm going to talk about vulnerability. I'm going to talk about multiple stressor interactions. And I'm going to introduce you to this framework called Resist, Accept, Direct, or the RAD framework, which is a pretty big deal in the Park Service and the other um, resource management agencies. Okay, so this is just to show you uh, some trend data. This is, so basically this is gridded data. This is different than what Stephen showed you. Okay, so this is basically all these different stations that are measuring temperature put into a model and then it, it interpolates it across the landscape. And then we take points from that and say what's going on with temperature. So this is just, the graph is just the centroid for the park. We have some statistics from the Alpine versus the Beaver Meadows area and the Kamenichi area, just to say that trends are different in different parts of the park. Uh, but the big picture is that when you look at it, on your annual scale, it is warming and the rate is increasing. So there's trend lines here, and the one that starts in 1900 is flatter than the one that starts more recently. So the rate is increasing um, as well, but also you see a lot of variability within those trends. And this is just showing you temp maximum temperature 
and minimum temperature. So you can think of it as day and night, average day and average nighttime temperatures. But Steve, Steve set me up really well for this because climate change is more than just annual temperature, right? <laughs> that, and there's a lot of different variability. There's so many different, when even just thinking about the physical aspects of what climate change embodies, these are just some, right? All the way from the seasonal temperatures and whether it's night or day, um, things like heat extremes, like growing season length, then you get into annual and seasonal precipitation, the extremes, the snowpack that we just learned about, and then things like humidity, evaporation. So when things are warmer, there's more evaporation, right? So even if precipitation is not changing, we can get a change in moisture, right? Uh, with the warming and evapotranspiration, that's the loss of water through all of the um, stomata in the plants. Okay, that also increases with warming. And things like soil moisture and uh, stream flow. So there's a lot to it in terms of the physical aspects of climate change. Um, I'm going to start with the alpine. So I had to start somewhere. And I, I kind of like this graphic because it puts it into a cartoon. Um, about some of the, when we say recent conditions, so sort of, you know, past conditions, there's a lot of, and this is kind of showing um, more, this is not the winter, obviously, the whole thing would be white, right? Okay, this cartoon. But, you know, up at the high elevations, we've got snow, we don't have that many trees, and things like that more recently. And then future scenarios, and to some extent, Current, perhaps, you know, we have reduced snow summer snowpack in the summer and, and cover. You know, and this is the predictions are, you know, the increase in um, trees and shrubs moving up in elevation. Some predictions about grass replacing wildfires. Um, air pollution, the nitrogen can also has that kind of prediction. Uh, exotic, so non-native plants invading alpine. And then we also have, we have some alpine species that can't live anywhere else. So they're obligate and uh, they're threatened. So these, are some, so these are some of the predictions about the alpine ecosystem. And so we'll just talk about what do we know about what's, what, what is actually going on. And in order to do that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about vulnerability. Um, it's, it's a, good concept for, for thinking about these things. And the big picture definition is the extent to which it can be a species, an ecosystem, an, another type of resource, or even a process, is susceptible from harm from climate change and other stressors. And there is a huge literature on this, on and how to do vulnerability assessments for species, ecosystems, and other things. Um, so you can break down vulnerability, and this might be a fun thing to think about as you go about and you think about different different things in your um, environment. But it's kind of broken down into the exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. So exposure is the exposure to a stressor, like climate change. Okay, but of course it can be all of those different variables, and it depends. Like, are you a creature that really, you know, is uh, influenced by the length of the growing season? Or are you a creature that's really influenced by how many days below freezing there are? So what, you know, what exposure to what variable depends on what you are, right? And then um, sensitivity is sort of like traits of that species or the ecosystem that can either make you more sensitive or less sensitive to this. And I'll show you some examples. And these can be physiological factors. They're often connected to genetics and things like that. Um, and when you kind of put those together, you can think about, well, those can be your potential impacts, okay? But what about the capacity to adapt? You know, like some species have more 
um, plasticity in their how they express their genes, depending on what the environment is. We call that phenotypic plasticity. Um, some have that more ability to disperse. Uh, we also have managers like me who can maybe, in some cases, help you know <laughs> the creature or thing adapt. Okay, and then when you put all that together. You can think it helps you think about vulnerability and and you know we want to reduce vulnerability and so there's i don't know if it's plus or multiplication or division but that's kind of generally how uh this concept is thought about so you know like i said here's some examples um here is narrow environmental tolerances is also awesome often what could make a species sensitive. Um, oh, and I'm talking about the alpine. So this is what, okay, I remember why I put this. Okay, so in the alpine, here are some of the things we're worried about. Warming temperatures, earlier snowmelt, drying, things like that. Uh, we have those obligate alpine species. Not everyone up there is only in the alpine, some move around, but we do have obligate ones with narrow environmental tolerances. And by the nature of the alpine, there's a, a limited ability to move up the mountains and you run into rock, you run into sky. Right? Okay, so I'm gonna tell you um, a little bit about a very cool study that's going on in parks. It's actually going on across the world. There are you know, hundred, over a hundred of these areas across the world. When I worked in the San Juans, we put in one down there. It's called Gloria, Global Observation Research in Alpine Environments. It's very much focused on, on alpine plants. Um, there is a site in the park. There's also one in Yellowstone and Glacier, if you're interested. They're monitored by our partners at the National Park Service Rocky Mountain Inventory and Monitoring Network. And one site is four peaks, and they look at all four aspects. Uh, and the plants are um, monitored every five years, and the soil temperature is a continuous sen sensor data. And you can see right here, here's some plots um, for one of the aspects of one of the peaks. Okay. And um, so this was put in in 2009, so we don't have that much results yet. But one of the neat things is that Rocky Mountain National Park has really our sites, and granted these are only just four peaks in the whole park, but a lot of diversity. So a lot of different species of plant taxa and also lichen was part of this study. Um, and as of 2014, at least in these plots, there was only one non-native species, and that's dandelion. Dandelion spreads by wind. So it is not surprising that it got up there. And um, it, it's not unusual that we have dandelion up high. Um, so what else have we learned? So this, this is an example of the soil temperature, you know, um, data. And there's a, you know, a lot of fluctuation each year because of the season. Um, this goes from 2008 to 2014. So none of these trends are what we call statistically significant. Okay, when you run up through statistics program, it's like, well, it looks like they're going up, but we're, we don't quite call them going up yet because of the probability that it could be something else going on, right? But all the slopes are upward, so that is a hint. And also just when you only have this many years of data, it's kind of hard to have a statistically significant trend. So we'll have to wait until we, um, they, they haven't crunched the data yet, even from 2000. So it takes a lot of work. Um, so, but it this, you know, it's reflecting that maybe the soils are warming. Stay tuned. Um, and then some updates from the monitoring 2019. Unfortunately, there were some new invasions of exotic plants, like this reed canary grass. It's still, they're still rare, but starting to creep up. 
And we, they did see upslope movement of trees and shrubs. Um, but there's a lot more to tell, and I can't tell it to you yet because <laughs> the results are not out. So we there is a vulnerability assessment going on. So we're looking at those different aspects I shared with you of key plant species. So part of it is what species they have enough data to do this analysis on. So they can't be too rare um, to do this. But then it's also like we want to know, can you do this analysis on species that we use for planting? Because we plant in alpine. We, when stuff gets trampled, sometimes we have projects to plant and we really hope they don't get trampled again. Uh, and also when there's construction, you know, and disturbed uh, land, we plant. So like what, when we plant an alpine, can you tell us something about what species we should use that are doing better, right, as the climate changes? And then there are other species, like for example, maybe species that are important um, to our uh, associated tribes, you know, maybe, we really like to know what's going on with those species. Um, and then the next monitoring campaign is in 2024. Okay, so PICA is kind of poster child of um, climate change in mountains. And there is reason to be concerned in the Great Basin. So west of where we are, there have been a lot of extirpations of PICA. Um, where they have mountains that go like this. Our mountains are like this, right? We have a lot of high area. So we haven't seen the extent of changes that have been observed in the Great Basin, but it, we're, it's still an area of concern. So I think this is a great species to talk about vulnerability because they are very vulnerable, right? Um, so in terms of their sensitivity, they are sensitive to high temperatures. So um, they have a hard time shedding heat. If their out temperature is greater than 25 degrees C, which is kind of like room temperature, um, they can die if they can't avoid those temperatures, they will die. And they tend to be disappearing where summers are warmer. But then it can also be too cold for them. Um, so they have, they have a really high metabolic rate to keep warm. They have to spend a lot of energy on that. Um, and when there's not a thick snow cover, they, they don't get insulated. They live in the talus and they don't have that insulation. So if they have a, very, if they have a particularly cold winter with less snow cover, that can be really dangerous for them. And so the idea of disappearing from cold places with little snow is also a threat to them. Um, and I know you heard from Chris Wright, so I'm not going to go too far into this story. You heard from her in a previous one. But just for those who didn't, um, this is a species that live in these rocky areas way up high in the talus. They spend the summer collecting their orbs and yummy things to eat. And then they save them in their hay piles and they eat them in the winter. They don't hibernate like some of our species. Okay. Oh, and this is all from Chris Ray at CU Boulder. So here's a model that was run, and this is with one of her collaborators um, for the park. And this is actually not even RCP is not even like the most severe climate change. So this we're already anyway. Just know that this is not a very drastic scenario in the model that this was run, and you can see that. This is not a very happy story for pica, right? In terms of the model <laughs> prediction. So um, the red colors are high probability of pica presence and the yellow are low. And you can see that it's declining. And um, you know the model is spitting out what cold winters and warm summers are predicted to do. Um, and that also the incorporated in the model that dispersal, so moving, is less, less, less successful when it's they're at low elevations and on south-facing slopes. So, but that's not the end of the story, perhaps, you know, because you can think about it like this. So 
we have exposure, both hot and cold. We have a very sensitive species. We have this potential impact. We have some questions about, well, will the dispersal be enough? And can maybe humans help them? Uh, how much genetic adaptation uh, can, do they, can they have within their population? And again, what can management do? And are there things that we haven't even thought of in terms of this species? And so um, there's, there's a lot of work going on with this. And it's one example. Um, okay, let's see. Is my next slide? Okay, so I'm continuing on with small mammals. And this, I wanna share with you this study. It's very interesting. This is Christy McCain at CU Boulder. Um, she studies elevation diversity of all sorts of different kinds of critters on elevational gradients. I worked with her when I was in the San Juans as well. And so this study um, looked at rodent and shrew species. So pika is not one of them. They're a rabbit relative. Okay, so they're not in here. But um, and. They, she compared the ranges between two time periods, so the 1886 to 1979, and she did that through historical records, okay, like museum specimens. And we have places where there are a lot of records of sightings and also like animal parts in drawers that record these things, okay? <laughs> um, the park doesn't have that much of that kind of thing, but. Um, is different uh, museums do. And then the recent time period, 2005, 2018, that was actually going out and looking, so sampling, which is very labor, labor intensive. These are some of the examples of what they looked at. They had transects in the San Juan and in the Front Range. You can see it was all the way from in the valley, way up almost to the continental divide. So a lot of elevation range there, including the park. Okay, this is part and region. And I, oh, okay. All right, so the, the big story is there's lots of variability because you're talking about all these different species, right? And they have all their different tolerances and abilities and things like that. Um, and, you know, you might think about the methodology, it's not perfect either, right? It's like this older time period through specimens and a newer time period during sampling, right? So what but what can we tease out? Tease out. <laughs> so the average range shift was upward, okay. Uh, but there's a lot of some had no change, some went the shift was downward. You know, climate change, if you just look at very simplified, what does it do? It predicts going up to get to um, get away from the warming temperatures, right? Um, and then there were a few that were local extra, locally gone, basically, but um, that's just from the sample. Um, and, but she did find out that the front range species were shifting upward more than the San Juan, and that the exclusively montane species, so the higher ones, the ones up in the mountains, shifted up more often, um, than the lower elevation ones and had larger shifts. So in terms of vulnerability, this in general, it did you know, have a result that these montane cold adapted species, also in the southern portion of the ranges, had the most common range shifts. But just to give you an idea, <laughs> this is an example of the variability. So these are all, these are um, uh, shortened versions of the lat names for all these critters. And you can see that this is just for the front range study. You can see there's a ton of variability. So for example, range shifts down, one, I gave you some of the species here. I uh, highlighted ones you might be particularly interested in, like the least chipmunk. In this study, shifted down, which is again, uh, opposite the prediction, right? No change in a bunch of different uh, species, up but expanding, so a bigger range than where they were. Abert squirrel, that's one of people's favorites, so I bolded that one. 
Um, and then up and contracted is our friend, the yellow belly marmot. So going up and a little bit less of a, of a range. And then up and just shifting without contracting or expanding are these other species, including the golden mountain ground squirrel that we see quite a lot. And so I just shared this with you. It's like, okay, there's a general trend, but there's a lot of variability. What uh, climate variable are, are they, or variables are they reacting to? What else is going on? You know, they are preyed upon. They have different things going on, right? Okay. So um, that leads me to introduce the other concept, and I'm gonna focus that climate change, that there are multiple stressors and that climate change does not work alone. Okay, so those physical variables are not the only thing that's going on. We have a lot of other stressors out in our landscape and we have disturbance events going on as well. Um, and I'm gonna talk about the other stressors and just give a few quick examples right now. So um, really quick about the white-tailed ptarmigan. Ptarmigan, um, and I'm just mainly gonna talk, talk about the population on Trail Ridge Road along Trail Ridge Road, and it's a case of potentially interacting stressors. Um, so this white-tailed ptarmigan is mainly like up in Canada and in the Arctic, and then in the Western mountains, there are like these relic small populations in the mountains from the last glaciation. And ptarmigan is a really cool grouse-like bird. In the winter, they have white feathers. In the summer, they have Darker feathers, this is kind of in between. You can probably guess why. So something about that might be going on, right? Um, and then in terms of our just the population along Stone Ridge Road, we do have evidence that it is in decline. You know, this species was actually petitioned to be on the Endangered Species Act. The evidence came in and it was decided it was not warranted because other populations are, are doing okay, even in the state, okay? So it's not an endangered species act, but we have this issue with their trail ridge road population. And so what's going on? This is just to think about not only the vulnerability of the species, but also the multiple different stressors. So, and we have um, Cameron Aldridge with the USGS has taken over this study and been doing this research in the parks. We're glad, so glad to have him as a partner. Um, so warming effects, one of the things he's been re researching is uh, the seasonal mismatch between the time of nesting for these birds and when their food is available. Hmm. So the nesting is happening earlier, but if the food isn't coming earlier, that really can affect the chick's success. When the chicks are born, they eat a lot of insects. As they mature, they start eating more like um, alpine buttercups and willow buds and all sorts of plants, basically, and seeds. So, but that could be a, a big issue with these, with this species and this population. We also have issues with elk in Rocky Mountain National Park. If you haven't heard, we have an elk and vegetation management plan. We've been working on that for a while. Um, but there is elk browsing on alpine willow, and alpine willow is a really important resource for this species. And then also, human disturbance along Trevor's Road, you know? Other than Bear Lake, where do you go find people in Rocky Mountain National Park, right? Drove to drove. So, you know, this is the thing that we, we don't have the answer to this yet, but if we can understand these things better, maybe we can help this species. Okay, I'll give another example, mountain lakes and interacting stressors. Okay, so, and then I'll just say, uh, I worked on this when I was a grad student. Dr. Jill Bowman was my PhD advisor. So, and she's been studying up in Longdale, that watershed for 1981, okay? And there's a study that started to look at acid rain. And then it was like, okay, it's not really acid rain that's the big problem here, but it's nutrients coming in with air pollution. We call it atmospheric deposition. Nitrogen is a big one. What happens when you add nitrogen to your garden? Yeah, okay, same with, I can have the same effect on algae, right? So when I was a grad student, we were seeing really subtle shifts 
and species and how these algae were growing and things like that. There were shifts going on in the old growth forest. You couldn't see them, okay? It was like those subtle warning signs that something was changing and we thought it, we, it was really good evidence it had to do with the nitrogen. Now, the water has warmed, not every single year, but in general, the trend is warming. And this is the lock. And now they, you know, we see some years have visible, you can see it with your naked eye, algal blooms. That is a new thing, okay, that we know, that, that, of that we know. It never happened earlier in the study. Okay, so interacting stressors. So, but the thing is, with interacting stressors, one of your tools, can you, can you reduce one of the stressors? If they're interacting and causing this problem, if you can reduce one, maybe you can really reduce the problem. So even before the algal blooms became visibly noticed, this was after I finished and went away, so I can't take any credit for this. Um, uh, my research was part of the body of knowledge. The Rocky Mountain National Park, um, and there was litigation that kind of kicked us into gear, I would say, in the park, like potential litigation, so I won't lie about that. But the, we, we partnered up with the state, the EPA, and the park to start this nitrogen reduction initiative, and also working with an agricultural subcommittee with, from all these different groups. And we actually have a plan, you know, we only can influence this, to try to reduce the nitrogen, okay? So that is ongoing work. And I'm happy, so we have it and we're trying to, oops, let me just click, go back. Our goal is to go on that green glide path. It's a very complicated graph. It will take too long to explain it, <laughs> but we want to go down, right? Um, but I would say one of the successes of the program and working with the, all the different partners is that it hasn't gone up, okay? So that's another way to look at it. Oh, question? Can, can you just talk a little bit about how you approach reducing nitrogen? I mean, I'm familiar with runoff from agriculture coming oh. in, and but there's nothing above the park. So how oh, do you stop nitrogen sorry. from coming from the air? That's it's a, airborne, that's... right? So it's air pollution. So for example, the reason why we're working with agriculture is because, um, not only the fertilizer that ag users use can volatize up into the air and get blown up into the park, but also the animal waste that is associated with these blown up. Oh. And we know that's a part of it because we look at the chemistry of the deposition and we know that tends, that's the ammonia component and that's been going up. And meanwhile, the state has been doing things to regulate the nitrogen oxides. And the country has, so that's been going down. But so, it's not just from runoff. It's not just downstream areas. I have no idea. No, I'm shocked. Air. I'm shocked. It's a huge mess. Yeah. 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 Wow. <laughs> yep. So like, just because you draw a boundary around the park, yeah. doesn't stop the climate, doesn't mm -hmm. stop the air, you know, all that. So anyway, and I just threw this in because. This has become, you know, visitation is a, has gone up a lot in the park. You guys all know this very well. We are dealing with it uh, to some extent, and we're in a plan, planning process, okay, right now. Dubas, if you haven't heard, another topic. But we did ask, well, what are the visitors' impacts on nitrogen? Because you know, you know how you put nitrogen in the park? You pee. Okay, uh, and so we've been doing studies of human waste. There are also other aesthetic and health concerns about other forms of human waste, right? Um, and we actually are about to put out a paper in, a, in Ecosphere, which is a scientific journal, journal that Joe Barron led, but we're a bunch of us are involved. So we asked about, well, how much do visitors contribute to the nitrogen budget compared to what's in the air? And I will say that it is a significant but small amount. Yeah. At least according to our estimate. Okay, so now I'm gonna, I got to keep on going and talk about this part, disturbance events. We know this well here. Sierra Nevada, where I worked before in 
it's Glen Canyon National Park. You know this well there. Okay, this is happening a lot where climate change is is colliding with natural disturbance events because droughts and fire and flood are all natural, right? We've always had them, but we know that climate change is changing them. So I'm going to talk about uh, forest change as to kind of get into this. And some of the things that we talk about are hotter, drier, earlier snowmelt, so therefore reduction in spring snowpack, amplified beetle outbreaks. The beetles that we have are native species, but climate change is amplifying them, and increased wildfire frequency. Um, and the amplified part about the beetle outbreaks is when you have warmer temperatures, it can actually affect their ability to reproduce. And also, when the trees are drought stressed, they have less defenses. So there's an interaction. This is showing a uh, mountain pine beetle in orange and spruce beetle in blue. And then also, the, you know, there's been a variety of publications, but this is specifically one on Rocky Mountain subalpine forest. Some of the study sites are in our park. Um, that it is increasing in 2020 was a big year in our lives, but it actually was like the pivoting point of where this shift happened in terms of like the data, in terms of subalpine fire frequency for our region, for subalpine forests. So I wanted, I do want to tell you about this study that um, went on. So there were some plots that were put in on the east side of the park in the forest with the peat pot plots because Dr. Pete put them in. Um, but then one, someone who works in the park, Scott Esser, he did his master's thesis where he re-measured them. So there's 68 of them. And um, we found out some things from that. And here's just the summary. So from those years, species composition was relatively stable. New species only were arriving in 13 percent of the plots, but forest structure shifted more towards the larger trees, diameter trees, with fewer small diameter. And I think one of the most interesting things from that study was that species migration was probably upslope on south-facing slopes, but more stable across north-facing slopes. So, you know, aspect is really important in ecology. Not only elevation, but there's aspects, there's distance from water, there's drainage patterns, all those things can affect um, species' ability to survive and things like that, okay? So, but that was 10 years ago. Oh, and I wanted to throw this in because this is just really cool, and I'm really proud of Scott for this. So he took his master's thesis and he worked with a teacher at um, Thomas Jefferson High School, which is in Denver. And they came up with, a, it, it, this was like an AP level cut type of curriculum, a very um, honors kind of level. But they actually learned about this study and they would go out to a, a plot or two and basically remeasure it. So we don't have that many plots that have been remeasured since 2013, but we have a handful. And then we also have all these amazing young people learning how to do this and learning what they're finding. And if you Google Forest in Motion, you can read that article, it's very cool. And I also wanted to say that um, there will be a repeat of all the plots in a couple years. And we're gonna incorporate, um, we're gonna have, it's, college students are going to do it. So it's also going to be um, a really great learning opportunity as well. And that's what citizen science is all about, using volunteers, using students to collect data. It's an amazing education opportunity, plus we get data we need for management. Um, OK. And, uh, ooh. OK. I will have to hurry up. So now this is, we're talking about multiple stressors here. So thinking about forests and wildfire, 
We got the wildfire. It's a natural thing. It's changing from climate change. Okay, and climate change affects in terms of forests. Also, what can grow after the fire comes through because the environment is different, right? The climate might be different than it was 50 or more years ago when the, the forest first grew, right? And then we got the beetle mortality. Um, and then we have fuel treatments that we do to reduce fuel. Okay, we've got all this stuff going on. So one of the neat studies that we have going on, we're kind of cutting it off, but um, is looking at these, these questions of how do different factors affect post-fire forest trajectories? And you can break it down to exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. And the key things is the interaction, because really are they acting alone? And you know, we we want to know how these different factors interact and also are the fuel treatments, you know, it, where they happen, are they doing anything that maybe are providing a little bit of um, lower sensitivity to the ecosystem? Um, and then luckily we do, we have a study going on with um, Dr. Seibel from CSU and there's going to be, a, there's a conifer forest component and then there's also an aspect. Um, I will do want to just mention about invasive plants. That's another part of the story. Whoops. Um, because it's also multiple stressors, uh, but it, you can also think about it in terms of um, management action. So humans transport plant crop yields and disturb native vegetation. So these are non-native plants that can invade and take over from native plants. And we bring them in, and then we also disturb soil so they can grow better, right? Warming can increase suitability because these are generally coming from lower elevation, and wildfires cre create open space. Um, so this is an example of management action. So we have this amazing crew. This summer will be their third year that goes out and is treating these uh, exotic plants um, out in the wilderness. And they found, for example, last year, 424 new infestations. Mm -hmm. So this is a big deal. And we are um, working on it. We're not going to get it all, OK? But this is one thing that we can do in terms of management action, uh, in terms of all these multiple stressors with forests. And the last thing I'm gonna do is leave you with this framework, okay? Because this resist, accept, direct framework, because um, we do have choices, right? And we can work to resist changes. Some of them will be futile, so we have to prioritize them, right? We can accept that things are changing, Okay, maybe do things a little differently. And we can also direct, which means like the wind, so the, the, the accept boat is just getting blown by the wind wherever the wind takes it, right? The resist boat, you're using your motor to go against the wind, right? The direct boat, you're using the wind, but you're kind of like steering it to the way you want to go so you don't crash on the rocks. You maybe end up on a nice beach instead, um, even though it's a different place. And so this is one thing we've been thinking about a lot because you can only re resist so much. You really have to prioritize. What, what's the most important? Where is the most important? What has the most chance of actually working? There's going to be a lot of acceptance because we, you know, that's just how it's going to work. And then there are going to be some areas, and the direct is kind of the new one. Um, so, just some of the examples I've talked about three of these. Well, actually, yeah, I've talked about three of these. So, fuel reduction before wildfires, the nitrogen reduction initiative, treating invasive plants. So, it's like resisting, it's reducing other stressors, all these things. <clears throat> One I didn't mention is replanting species of concern after fires, which we're doing for limber pine. And that's a whole story into itself. We're hoping to start this summer. Um, other things, and this is a prelude to what the 
the kids are going to talk about, at least partially, is the important number of riparian areas, healthy wetlands. And I know the coalition has been working on this a lot. So this is the Kawichi Valley on the other side of the park. It did not act as a fuel break. It is highly degraded. It does not have fever and tall willows and what it used to have. And we're doing a huge partnership project for gearing up to work on that. But imagine if it was a healthy wetland with beaver ponds everywhere and willows that have a lot of water in their foliage. Would it have helped us maybe to manage that fire in a more beneficial way? Maybe, okay? Um, and I think I'm over my time, but some other direct examples that have to do with Aspen. And uh, I'm gonna put this here. Oh yeah, there we go. Cooperate. I'm gonna close it up here. And just say thanks for listening. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good time for questions. I'm happy to try. Yes, in the back. How do these species arrive? Was it the wind, the fire storm, the invasive plants? Yeah, some Right. Okay, so I didn't go into that depth on what they're doing, but um, in general, where we see more invasive plants are along trails because that's the corridor not only for people, but for stock. Um, and we use stock in our operations to try to take care that they're not, they need weed-free feed, right? Um, but they can eat, if, if they're eating invasive plants, they're out, if stock are out enough that they're actually eating the stuff and then transporting it up, that can also happen. Um, so, and also in disturbed areas like, uh, you know, we are doing construction on Fall River entrance, right? So we can have a better entrance station. There's a lot of soil disturbance. Part of that project is replanting. Part of that project is exotic plant treatment, but it's not perfect, right? So there's a lot of things. So dandelions get in with wind. Most of these species, the ones that are most invasive, get in attached to shoes, clothes, vehicles, stock, for yes, so but they do we do we tend to focus on places where people are the most because that's like the vector that goes out into the wilderness. So a lot of the work they did was along the trail corridors around like wilderness campsites um, and things like that to try to keep them from spreading into the open areas that the wildfire creates. Any more? How vulnerable are we to fire? How vulnerable are we to fire? Oh, yeah, it's it's possible that a wildfire, and it almost happened in 2020, could burn down large amounts of Estes Park. So um, we need to be ready for that. Yeah. Um, given the incredible diversity and complexity of the data that we've all seen, yeah. are there a couple interventions to cut, cut through the noise a little bit for us to think about what can we as individual property owners or as an organization, what should we be focused on? Yeah. How can we be adjusting and adapting and directing? Great question. So, I mean, the, the, co the coalition's work um, with restoring riparian areas after the flood is really important because if we can get those to be wetted beavered areas again, then they can actually, maybe they'll act as sort of fuel breaks to maybe help it be easier to manage fires. You know, there's defensive space that we, uh, you know, that we can do on private property. I know the Estes Valley, Valley Fire Protection District is doing some things to really gear up to also be helping um, you know, people who live here, like myself, to be able to do that. Um, there's, you know, and so those are kind of some direct things. 
I know um, I gave some examples about exotic plant management, um, keeping wetlands healthy, uh, reducing air pollution. You know, those are some of the things that we can do. And I will say, you know, I said it's possible that the town could burn down. And it is, right? But, you know, and people ask why in 2020 did East Hoboken not come out of the park? We got lucky with some weather shifts, right? It snowed. Okay, we had some awesome firefighting tactics from our fire, the firefighters who were here. And we had fuel treatments that they could use as um, anchors to do those like burning operations where they, they burn out so when the fire comes that there's less fuel. Um, had we not gotten weather change, maybe the fuel treatments wouldn't and the firefighting wouldn't have been enough. But, but we did. And thank goodness we had the firefighting with fuel treatments to be able to take advantage of that. So it's a mixture. Okay. And that means um, taking out the diseased trees, making uh, burn piles. We're doing that with the uh, property owner's permission in certain areas in town. And that keeps our waters clean. If those trees, if we had a fire go through and the forests were unhealthy, all that uh, debris would, would uh, affect our health of our rivers. Um, we are constantly planting every year new um, native plants along the rivers, and that provides sustenance to our wildlife. So if you want to help, we're, one thing you can do is um, donate to our group because all of our grants, or most of our grants, ask for matching funds. And we have to come up with that in order to get our jobs done. Uh, we have one full-time staff member, member one and a half. <laughs> and so uh, they've got a lot on their shoulders. Anyway, if you think about donating, please. All right, it's time for the bear to draw. We've got another packet of Colorado wildflower seeds. <laughs> <laughs> the bear lost weight since I've seen it. <laughs> I am Robbie Davis. I am the uh, sixth grade science and STEAM teacher over at the middle school. And I also sponsor the environmental resilience team. There are nine members, three of which are here today to present their proposal uh, for the RISE Challenge. I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on that just so you know what it is. Um, so the RISE Challenge is a statewide challenge uh, for students to create a proposal and project that improves community resilience um, against natural hazards. Wrong. So they have to uh, create an environmental uh, civic action story to present in front of um, a panel of judges. The judges are um, community experts in, uh, across the state, and the stories are judged on innovation, uh, research, stakeholder communication, budget, visuals, and overall community impact of their action. The 10 finalists will then showcase um, their stories at what they call a summit on May 9th and take part in a reflection panel and um, the top 10 can win the, uh, up to $1,000 in prize money. 
So I'm pleased to say that last year they took first place. They focused on um, fire mitigation. And uh, this year, they'll tell you. Uh, so this is uh, pretty much their proposal with some extra added stuff to, to give you a little bit more information. So this is Carson and Leela and Eva, and they will take it from here. Um, so we focus on movie code and wetland restoration. So this is us. We are two of inspired students at Estes Park Middle School. We greatly want to change our environment around us for the better. Um, we created the Environmental Resilience Team to help raise awareness of environmental issues and advocate for change in our school, community, and further beyond us. Welcome to Estes Park. Estes Park is a small mountain town with about 5,000 residents. It's the gateway to Rocky Mountain National Park, bringing over 3 million tourists during the summer months who come to sightsee and explore the outdoors. Wildfires, floods, harsh winds, blizzards, and landslides endanger Estes Park's community, people, flora, and fauna. So Estes Park is part of the Wildland Urban Interface, or WUBI, which is an area where structures and other human developments meet or intermingle with, wild, with wildland vegetation, and this makes it especially vulnerable to wildfires. In the past few years, these troublesome Hammond Peak, Left Hand Canyon, and Kruger Rock fires have affected our community. Due to this, it's incredibly important to follow all fire codes and protect and preserve our beautiful town. These are the wildland urban interface areas within our state, and this map shows the wildland urban interfaces interface area across the state of Colorado. <coughs> the colors on the map represent how many houses are per acre of land, so the closer the dots, the more populated the area. This map is from 2018 and can be updated. So the wood cut areas need to be redefined to include wildfire risk, which is much larger than it was originally. <coughs> As you can see, our communities are a statewide issue. As a state, Colorado needs to focus more on wood code needs or wood code areas. Fire threats is increasing is increasing and threatening more communities. This map shows wildfire risk and large fire areas from 2000 to 2022. The state needs to help regulate codes in these areas to help prevent wildfires and expanding into communities. are the codes that we have that we're focusing on the wood codes um wildland urban interface codes address fire spread accessibility defensible space and water supply for buildings constructed near wildland areas the codes outline regulations to safeguard life and property from the intrusion of wildland fire to, and to prevent structure fires from spreading to wildland fields Depen defensible space and provides ignition res Resistant construction requirements to protect against fire exposure and resist ignition by burning ember embers. Standards for emergency access, water supply, and fire protection. Requirements for automatic fire suppression and safe solar practices. So, why are buoy codes important? The hope is that we can comply with buoy building codes that will help save structures at a lower cost. In Chapter 5 of the Wubi Code, titled, titled Fire Resistance Related Construction, it states buildings should be constructed with fire retardant wood, wood plastic composite, and plastic, plastic lumber. For example, decking should be built using Trex composite decking rather than wood. It has been proven that composite materials cost roughly the same price as non fire resistant materials. It would also save more money to build composite materials in the first place. Then to rebuild after a fire loss. According to FEMA, the one time cost of these measures is typically less than 5% of the cost of a home and its contents. In addition, the benefit cost ratio in movie fires is $4 to 1, meaning it saves $4 for every $1 that a fire mitigation or 
on party measures. We met with Chief Wool, our local fire chief, and discussed this issue at length. He states having a standard model code, minimum standard, helps keep costs down by establishing consistency for all to follow. The code will support communities to address the unique challenges and recognize the variability in risk across the state. He introduced us to the Senate Bill 23166, which gave us the idea to pursue further. So this is a video. This is a video of basically one house that is not filled with fire resistant material, and then the other house is. And yeah. <laughs> so they saw this video and they thought it would be helpful to kind of emphasize what they were saying. Let's see if it plays. Yeah. Is there sound? Uh, good question. <laughs> Do you know if there's sound? There's no reason to think that they're going to get better. So if you look at this kind of impact on the variations that the climate has had, we are far more susceptible to the size and intensity of fires. The Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety is on the front lines of fire research. Wright is a former FEMA official and native Californian. His parents lost their home in the campfire last year, the worst in the state's history. Roughly 14,000 homes there burned to the ground. Wildfire damage to property just in California last year totaled nearly $19 billion, according to CoreLogic. There are steps that we can take so that the impact of that fire is narrow, it doesn't spread as far, and it impacts far fewer structures in terms of that kind of generative over and over, fire beginning, fire beginning, fire beginning, fire. So the Institute built this test home, one side incorporating fireproof design and materials, the other not. So we have a six inch gap here from the top of the rock mulch to the start of the siding. And this six inch gap, just like our five foot zone, gives us a non-combustible area. A wildfire's wall of flames may look most dramatic, but it's actually the flying embers that can be even more destructive. Satellites have captured embers flying up to seven miles from a wildfire. These start secondary fires. The siding, roof, and landscaping on this home protect it from those embers. There's no such thing as a fireproof but there is a wildfire-resistant home. While the cost to real estate from wildfires is rising, the cost to build a fire-resistant home like this one is actually the same or even less than a typical home. The savings is in the cement siding, cheaper than wood materials. That offsets cost increases in gutters and vents. All of it far less than the cost of total loss. So we are focusing on Colorado Senate Bill 23166, the establishment of the Wildfire Resiliency Code Board. This bill serves the purpose of. I don't think the mic works now. Is it off? Is it because I started the volume? Try it now. This bill serves the purpose of ensuring. <laughs> This bill serves the purpose of ensuring community safety and resilience to these wildfires in the areas. 
The bill is actually the wildfire resiliency code board comprised of the diverse group of representatives and stakeholders. This bill also identifies hazards and where defensible space is needed. It defines where worry areas are and it adopts codes to ensure that buildings and homes stay safe. <clears throat> Call to action of capital. This bill is important to us because we live in a rural area and it would impact us in our community for the better. Wildfires have constantly tormented our town the last few years and we are expanding available homes for new citizens. As a result, we are hoping that the bill will be passed so that buildings are required to comply with the movie codes. This will ensure that new apartments have more defensible space and will be constructed of fire resistant materials. Building fire resistant homes will hit, play a part in slowing down wildfires and will also present, prevent mm -hmm. secondary fires due to embers. Lastly, homeowners are having difficulty getting insurance on their homes due to wildfire risk. Building fire resistant homes will help with obtaining insurance coverage. We email Senator Cutter to share our story. She responded very quickly and was eager to meet with us. After an eventful and wonderful morning, we were able to meet with Senator Cutter. She oversees the environmental bill that was prevailed to you by her bill, SB 23166, is important to us. With this, we discussed how wildfire and safety impact citizens in Access Park. We also discussed what we have contributed to in the past, including fire mitigation work and passing out go bags as a part of last year's Rise Challenge project. We are so glad to have a chance to meet with her and discuss what we are trying to advocate. She was excited to hear from young people and even asked us to testify at the next hearing of SB 23 166 when it reaches House Committee in a couple of weeks. And as of Friday, as of Friday, it is now it's, in the committee. It's in the House Committee. Yeah, it's in the House Committee. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, yeah, and we also were just taking a photo, and Governor Polis comes up behind us, and so we took a photo with him. <laughs> 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 um, Rocky Mountain National Park is an important part of our community. It is home to many species species of animals, some of which are close to being endangered. This national park is important to us because it is where we hike, ski, and make memories. We want to preserve this special area for future generations. We also met with the resource stewardship manager of Rocky Mountain National Park to learn about some of the Issues within the park. Um, some of the topics we were also interested in were the unhealthy wetlands, bark beetle, bark beetle infestations, and invasive plants. Here we see a healthy system. We have our neighbors and our top predators. However, when we take our predators out, then the elk numbers increase because there is no predators to help the elk stay balanced. This affects the willow and aspen that the elk eat, causing the willow and aspen to decrease in numbers. If we take away the beaver, then the beaver dam numbers go down because there are no beavers to build them. But this affects our water table, which also decreases. Overall, our biodiversity also decreases with the loss of our top predators and our beavers. So this is our resiliency action plan, and we chose to focus on the important restoring some of the unhealthy watersheds within our community, including in the national park. These areas are affected by drought, fire, flood, as well as climate change. However, once they are healthy, they can also help prevent spreading of wildfire and effects of future floods, and more importantly, restore biodiversity, including population of beavers. The park currently has wetland restoration projects in four <laughs> counties. 
Kalamichi Valley, Moraine Park, Upper Beaver Meadows, and Horseshoe Park. It's exciting to see recent beaver activity in some of those areas. So next time you come visit our beautiful national park and see the fenced off areas, be mindful that the future of our beavers and wetlands depend on it. We hope to help out with restoration efforts within the park sometime in the near future. Resiliency Action Plan 2. The other project we are working on is along Reach for on Fish Creek. Fish Creek runs along our schools and throughout several local neighborhoods. We met with the Estes Valley Water Commission at the site where we where <laughs> the 2013 flood damage occur, occurred. We were we will be planning planting about 30 native riparian trees and shrubs that would have been there had it the flood happened. This will also, this will not only help restore the lands, but also help prevent future flooding and restore a healthy ecosystem for aquatic and for terrestrial life. We're here at Fish Creek and we're looking at healthy wetlands that we're going to restore in the future. And we're also here to help help plant the plants that um, neighbors need, such as willow and aspen, with the hope that it'll help reintroduce beavers to our unhealthy wetlands. So, Ryan, how do you feel about the restoration of Fish Creek? I think it's an amazing idea because there's a lot we need to do to bring it back to the flood. So behind us, you can see everybody who's already working to restore our unhealthy wetlands and doing things like picking up trash. <laughs> so as part of our plan for the Rise Challenge, we have to do a community outreach. And part of our community outreach is being here today and sharing this with all of you. And then um, we just want and then we just want to say thank you for to our partners for making this happen. Do any of you have any questions? When you, when you testify, will that be through Zoom or how will that happen? Yes, yes. it will be yeah. through Zoom session. Yeah. And that'll be at a house hearing? Yes. On the bill. Okay. Great. Yes, we will be on Monday. Monday. Daughter, correct? Yeah. Yes, yes. Maya. Yeah. 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 The other students were at a choir event. Yes. Yeah. So. so you can yeah. see our young people are the stewards of the environment of the future. Well done, everybody. <laughs> Yeah. All right. These last two prizes are humdingers. Dinger. He is getting skinny. He doesn't, he doesn't have a poser.
comes. So this takes a moment. <laughs> yes, let's go ahead and quit. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll pick one. It's handed me two. All right. This is $70. This is a $70 rental uh, boat rental. Well, you can you can spend it at the Estes Park Marina, however you want. If you want to go in and buy a ride and rail, you can do that. But rentals is probably the way most people would spend it. All right, seventy bucks at the marina. Right. Free rental five seven six zero three seven. Well, some be present to win. Yeah, some people are left already. <laughs> okay. Let's try a different one. One more time. Should we check one more time? Mm -hmm. Zero three seven. Zero three seven. Zero three seven. Zero three seven. <laughs> okay. The last three digits of this one are zero two three. Woo okay. <laughs> And this is a hundred dollar certificate from the mountain shop. Yeah. See, it was worth waiting, right? <laughs> okay, last three digits zero three five. <laughs> Thank everybody now. Yeah. Okay, everybody, thank you for coming. Our staff, we want to uh, just introduce our staff briefly. briefly. Willem or Mellon. And Evan Jones. Our projects and writing grants. And our board members are here. We have Jennifer Waters. Just wait. Just wait. John James over there. There is Rachel. There are Rachel and Andy Ames right there. And of course, right here. Celeste Frazier. Coming, everybody. Stick with us. We've got more to show you as the year goes on. Thanks for having us.